the bad. All right. Okay. Gary, this way. This way. This way. Say hi. All right. All right. I am going to put you down. I'm going to. Yes, there we go. Okay, those were our Audi Minutes. Welcome back to Just Chatting. And this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings, sort of, for our own amusement. So, we are looking at the second half of the autohagiography. And consequently, because it was just released today, we are going to do three videos in rapid succession. The one that we're doing to begin with now is the first of the three, part two. So when we come back, Okay, before we get into this, I'd like to remind you all to subscribe and ring the notification bell. Ding, ding. And that way, when the next two videos come out, you will be notified. And it may be the middle of the night. It may be early in the morning. It, they're coming out when I finish them because I want you to have them as quickly as possible. But, of course... I'm not just going to throw something out there. I am going to at least synthesize the material and give you something cohesive. I'm not just going to slam it out just to make a deadline. Now, let's start with part two, number one. So this is actually the fourth episode, but they have been released in two groups of three. So this is the first of the second half. And this is a doozy because this one is the one in which they are actively and in my opinion viciously attacking the royal family, in particular William and Catherine. Uh, I think Charles and Camilla to a lesser extent, but yes, they are slamming the family big time with some utterly outrageous allegations. But we will get to that. Let me start by saying there is sort of a, a thesis statement in this particular episode. It's interesting because I've really had to work to tease a theme out of the previous three. This one Whoa, no, it's right there for the taking. This is the story of how Nutmeg and Ginger started out on the top of the world and got dragged down by the pettiness and jealousy of the royal family, in particular, William and Catherine. Oh, yeah. And uh, the allegations, which, which are Crazy. I mean, we are talking, you know, drop a nut over these two level crazy are right there. Uh, they're not even concealing it anymore. They're not even, they're not even dealing in euphemisms or glossing it over. It's, it's right there for the taking. So let's start off with what was being said in the video. It starts off with uh, the usual, you know, and Nutmeg having her friends flatter her. This is it's like the story of her life. My friends think I'm fabulous. Oh gosh, it reminds me so much of Mrs. Elton in Emma. The Jane Austen fans will know what I'm talking about. It's just, honestly, it is as if this woman 
is just cribbing Austin at this point, which is very sad. Her friends talking about how wonderful she is. That's this constant theme throughout this episode. But we start with the royal wedding. And here we have the name dropping and the humble bragging. You know, they feature all of the celebrities that were invited to the wedding. You know, celebrities that who knows if they knew them. I mean, the interesting thing is that allegedly they didn't know Oprah until after they went to California. But subsequently, it's starting to come out that they had met with Oprah before. Uh, before the wedding, who knows? But before California, yeah. So we don't know. There are all kinds of machinations going on here. And I don't know if we are ever going to get the full story on what these two connivers are up to. But yes, we start off with all of the celebrities, the Cloonies. We do know they did not know the Cloonies because the Cloonies were asked and they said no. That simple. But of course, they're there rather conspicuously. Uh, Idris Elba was there. Again, rather conspicuously. No idea who knew him. And uh, Serena Williams. Now, we know that she had subsequently said to Tom Bauer that she wouldn't exactly characterize her relationship with Nutmeg as friendship. That, in other words, it was a less close relationship than Nutmeg has suggested. Uh, the Beckhams and we know Nutmeg torpedo that relationship by claiming that Victoria Beckham sold uh, gossip about her to the tabloids. Yeah, because she's really going to do that. Uh, she needs the money. What can I say? Poor Victoria Beckham, how low she has sunk. That, by the way, is indicative of what was happening uh, in Nutmeg's mind as things progress. So we have this wedding, name dropping and the humble bragging, you know, with the, oh, just sort of all this for little old me. And how adored she was by the British public. Oh, and let me throw this in, because this was a little inconsistency. Very small, but Nutmeg and the Ginger Sock Puppet lie about very small things. I don't know why. Nutmeg says she asked Charles to walk her down the aisle. Previously, it had been said that it was Charles who asked her. But, hey, who knows what the importance of this particular story or version is, but there's always one. So we can expect that to come back to haunt us later. It was undeniable, and this is accurate. It was undeniable that the British people were very favorably disposed toward nutmeg before they got to know her. No question about it. They they just adored her, as they would have adored any young woman who came in and married into the royal family. That's what they do. It's like, oh, look, we've got a new little princess. Isn't that lovely? And then, of course, the press turned on her like this, overnight, just bang, racism, of course. And that is the theme of this episode. We were loved and then we were hated. Why? Because the royal family was jealous of their popular support and their popularity and the way they reacted with the people, the way the people reacted to them. Nutmeg was just so good at the job that people 
Catherine and Camilla, basically, were jealous of her. And there is no doubt that that is the message, even though they do not actually come right out and say it was Catherine and Camilla. They show the pictures, so, but they do come right out and say it was jealousy. Other members of the royal family were jealous of their popularity, and this is the new narrative. We had to leave because other members of the royal family were jealous of us and spreading vicious lies about us to the tabloids. Wow. And that's a heavy accusation. And it's one that they do not in any way support. Uh, not that they can. So let's take a look at some of the details. There was a point fairly early on in this episode where Harry comes up with this quote, and there's no context for it. He just says this thing and leaves it hanging there. This is what he says. Um, there was an expectation, right? Diana's boy, there was an expectation uh, to have a public wedding it was like uh, mission, uh, mission complete with William. And now let's see if this goes the distance with Harry. And then we can actually go job done. This strange sort of non sequitur. Now, in the Hodokopi interview, he attributes this thought or whatever you want to call it, to the spirit of his dead mother. It's as if my mother said she had finished her job with William and now she's focusing on me. This is very much the same thing. It's not exactly the same thing. Very much the same thing. It's just thrown out. It's a non sequitur and it doesn't really make sense. So it's not just a question of it doesn't fit in to what they're saying. But it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. I found it very interesting, though, because, as I say, it was something he had attributed to Diana. Well, to dead Diana. That's very important to keep this in mind. He's not saying that his actual living mother back in the 20th century said this. It's what he thinks his dead mother's spirit is saying. And in that context, it's striking me as very, very disturbed. That's one I'm going to go back and listen to a few more times. With any luck at all, some of the psychologists, the people with serious qualifications on YouTube, are going to start picking that apart a little because there's something really not quite right going on here. And I would love to hear a professional view on this. I know that just looking at it from my limited mental health training as a social worker, which is very different from a psychiatrist or a psychologist, Social workers, we are just trained to spot mental health issues and out-refer to people with real qualifications. So just so you know, um, that's just the way it works. That's the end of your training. And this is striking me as very disturbed. And of course, Diana was a constant insertion in this episode what they are focusing on primarily as sort of the, um, the pivot point in their relationship with the British public and the British press is the Australia trip, which was largely considered a great success. I'm not sure how the people of Australia viewed it, but the press viewed it as a great success. And Harry and Nutmeg were apparently very well received, very well uh, regarded in that context. 
And of course, Diana had made a trip to Australia when William was a baby. And uh, so, of course, Harry's making the connections because Nutmeg was expecting Archie and Diana went with a baby and, you know, just he can force a connection. I swear, you know, Diana chewed gum one day and Nutmeg actually lit a candle. Look at the connections. He's, he can force them out of nothing. So he's forced a connection here. Diana's trip to Australia was a smashing success. And there was nothing that came along afterward to tarnish it. She apparently really enjoyed being with the people of Australia. They enjoyed having her. Uh, Nutmeg, as we all know, was complaining rather bitterly about not being paid for what she was doing. So in that sense, it wasn't what I would call an unqualified success. There were bad things that came out of it. But Harry takes this to be uh, history repeating itself. Diana was loved in Australia. Nutmeg was loved in Australia. And the royal family was so jealous. And it was at that point that the evil royal family, William and Charles, on behalf of Catherine and Camilla, were feeding negative stories to the press. So here I'm going to pull a pop culture reference. I don't know how many of you may have seen the movie L.A. Confidential. If you haven't, check it out sometime. It's an entertaining movie. But there is a scene early in the movie. So if you don't want to watch it, watch the first 10 minutes. You'll get the scene out of the way and you'll be fine. Danny DeVito plays a very sleazy Hollywood gossip columnist who trades in stories. If someone gives him a good story about a lesser known performer, an actor, an actress, he will bury a story about one of the Hollywood stars that will be damaging to that star's career. So studio executives feed him little throwaway stories in order to hide the big ones. And I gotta say, Nutmeg must have watched that movie because that's really what this is sounding like. When Harry was talking about this, all I could hear was Danny DeVito's voice saying, yeah, you know, you give me this and I'll bury that. Harry is suggesting this is exactly the way the British media works, that they will bury a story unflattering to Catherine and William if Catherine and William provide a juicy story about him and Nutmeg. And of course, he is not just implying, he is saying outright that this was done. As I say, he didn't say that William and Charles did it, but he does show pictures of Catherine and Camilla. So certainly suggesting very strongly that they are the two he is referring to. I consider that to be over the top in terms of accusations of misconduct, because that is just not inappropriate in the context of the royal family as an institution. We're talking about his father, his brother, selling him and his wife down the river, which is outrageous. It's absurd to think this would happen in the first place, because these are people who clearly love Harry, well, at least they did, had nothing but his best interests at heart, and we're certainly not going to do something like this. But Harry has apparently become so crazy paranoid that this is how he thinks, not just, remember, not just the royal family, his personal family, his father, his brother. He thinks this is how they are treating him. And that is 
strange. It's especially strange when you consider that he is very clear in his suspicions that the family considered him a nutmeg threats after the success of the Australia tour. Now, the thing with this is this is 100% nutmeg thinking. And I have to say this, my American friends are going to understand this immediately. I'm saying this for my British friends. The reason we know the difference is because it takes an American to think that the British royal family works on a popularity contest basis. It's because we have elections every couple of years, and that's how we determine our leadership. We vote. Whoever gets the most votes wins. In effect, it's a popularity contest, right? Harry, along with all the British people, certainly knows that that is not how the royal succession works. You don't just go up, uh, let's take Victoria because she had a whole brood of children, and say, look, she's got a whole bunch of them, let's pick the one we like, and they're going to be the next ruler. No, it's not how it works, and it is so not how it works that I'm sure my British friends are probably scratching their heads saying, who could think such a thing? Who could think that Harry's popularity could be a threat to the succession. It can't be. It simply can't be. But from an American perspective, and remember, Nutmeg is an American. She is a woman of, frankly, I don't want to say limited intelligence. She's very crafty. She's got a very crafty mind. But she is a woman, despite her college degree, a very very limited exposure to the world. This is not someone who's ever paid attention to how things work for other people because she's very self-focused. Of course, she is going to think, oh, we were so popular, so they had to get rid of us because we were a threat to them. It can't be a threat. As long as William is alive, Harry has no place in the succession. It's so far down, it doesn't even count. You wait another 10 years, it's going to be even farther down. Let it go. The children will come before Harry, um, George, Charlotte, Louis. Harry is sloppy, well, he's not even sloppy seconds. He's sloppy sixths, and he's going to be even farther down the line. That's all there is to it. This is not something Harry would have considered a legitimate threat. But Nutmeg, yes. Why? Because our politics work as a popularity contest. So obviously she would be thinking that way. And that's how I am inferring that this is Nutmeg's craziness. That these are ideas she has dumped on Harry. Now, it's very true that Diana spoke of Charles being jealous of her success in Australia. We have no idea if this is true. We know that Diana did, in fact, say that it was. That's not just something out of the crown. Diana actually said that, that Charles was hurt that she was so much more popular in Australia than he was. Um, all I can say is... Charles was never considered very likable, and Diana was extremely charismatic. It is what it is. If Charles was going to get his panties in a bunch over it, oh well, he was just destined to a lot of crumpled panties, because the fact is, Diana was always going to be the one who resonated with the people. It was just the nature of her personality and, and her abundance of charisma against his. Period has nothing to do with Charles's value or Diana's value. It just has to do with public perceptions. That's all. 
Regardless, of course, this is another way in which Harry is likening his lovely nutmeg to his dead mother. And that is essentially the whole theme of this, that Diana was considered a threat to the royal family because she was so popular in Australia. Not sure where that one came from, but, you know, Harry's pulling all kinds of stuff out of his butt these days. Diana was not a threat because of her popularity. Diana's popularity was a good thing. It enhanced Charles's popularity and secured William's future position as heir to the throne. Absolutely, it was a good thing. The idea that the royal family would have resented her for it well, they just, they're not that stupid and short-sighted. Remember, this is a thousand-year-old monarchy. They are clear that there is a line of succession, that they are all links in a chain. And Diana was part of that. Diana was a link in the chain. Charles and Diana led to William. William leads to the next generation. They're clever enough to work that out. What's good for Diana is good for Charles while they are together, for William later. And the idea that nobody would have seen that is absurd. Also, the idea that people would have been jealous of Diana's popularity is absurd because we are talking about people who, who were probably in the most secure positions in the world. Why they would need to be jealous of her, no, no. So let's take a look at a few more of these. So I guess there are only a couple of other points I really want to mention. The rest is all nutmeg's friends flattering her, blah, 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 you know the drill. Um, she does briefly touch on her friends feeling the need to go to People magazine because of that horrible uh, time when she was so depressed and no one would let her get any help and and she just wanted to end it all, yada, yada, yada. I don't believe that for an instant. I do not believe that, period. The fact that her mother, a licensed counselor, insists that she was privy to this, didn't do anything, that makes me question it even more. Because no mother, never mind a mother, who was a qualified mental health counselor, would have allowed their child to remain in that kind of situation of emotional despair and not done something. Period. Doesn't wash. Sorry. Doesn't wash. So I'm setting that aside. She does talk about how her friends took it upon themselves to go to People Magazine and tell them how wonderful she was and how the problems with her father were all his fault, and she was blameless as an innocent little lamb. Yeah, right. Because if they had spilled the beans to People magazine without her permission, we know they wouldn't be in her life to be talking to the docudrama today. No, not at all. So that one is just utter foolishness. But what we see, too, is we see her defense of the baby shower. It's all, at this point, four episodes in. It's very much the same as Archie Types was. It's nutmeg self-justifying again and again, attacking back, defending herself against the allegations that were made and attempting to prove her innocence and retelling the story as it suits her. So, what were the important ones in this? Well, as I said, I started off in the beginning letting you know that it's the framework. 
It's the, we were the most popular people in the royal family, and other members of the royal family were so eaten up by jealousy that they just had to destroy us. And you fill in the blanks. Catherine, Camilla, and Charles and William, those were the people who were feeding negative stories to the press in order to destroy Nutmeg and Ginger's credibility, assuming they had any to begin with. No, what actually happened, we're not stupid. We saw it all play out. They were very, very popular, very popular. And then as more and more details started coming out, popularity was slipping. But this is something that Nutmeg should know because she spent her entire adult life chasing the limelight. She wanted to be in the spotlight. Granted, for most of her life, she wanted to be in the spotlights of Hollywood, but it's the same principle. You get up there, and if enough of that spotlight shines on you, it starts to reveal the warts and the blemishes, and people will start digging things up. People will start talking and sharing unflattering stories. The period when they began the fall is when the stories about the bullying started leaking out. Stories like how many nannies they went through in the first two, three weeks, who knows, because they really went through a lot of staff. What was going on? Nutmeg wanting to know why she wasn't getting paid for the royal tours. Nutmeg only wanting to do the royal engagements she wanted to do. The situation with Thomas Markle was, in fact, piquing people's curiosity. What kind of woman disses her entire family, big family on both sides, and only mommy shows up to the wedding? That started to encourage people to dig these things up. It was inevitable. Enough spotlight, and these things would come to the surface. That's all there is to that. Um, of course, she had the mandatory, you know, people decrying the racism of Great Britain, throwing a racist spin on all of this. And in fact, there was one really, really unfortunate picture that appeared after the birth of the putative child, Archie, that it, people holding a little monkey dressed up in a little suit. It was a picture probably from the 20s or 30s, and that came out on social media. It did not come out in the newspaper. And they not only showed the picture, they actually showed the subsequent apology from the person who published that picture to begin with. He referred to it as a gag pic, gag pic, and said that he didn't realize it was just, it was going to be taken the way it was. It was just a joke. So what they're saying now, and this is pretty much where they ended this hagiography, is that social media is somehow equally in conspiracy with the royal family and the British press, you know, and who knows how many other racists they're lumping into the group. So what we are seeing is the beginnings of what looks like a narrative that is starting to become very paranoid and very delusional. And certainly it contradicts what our common sense tells us and what we remember as we watched it play out at the time. So that's what I have for you. I don't want to say today. I've almost said today for this video. Uh, we have two more coming as soon as I can put together something cohesive for you. And it should be within the next 24 hours. So let's take a look at a slideshow on the way out. Have a terrific day.